Coming up, I'm going to share three ways to know that you're in the wrong job. And then the biggest four-day work week trial has ended. We'll break it down. Google and Facebook CEOs are warning the slackers. Let's go. Coaching you up to get the competitive edge to make more money and experience more meaning in your work. That's going to give you a better work life and a better real life. They're too connected, and life is too short to be miserable in either one of those areas. And uh, I'm going to help you. I'm going to coach you up, keeping you informed, and advising you. So three ways to know that you're in a wrong job. I mean, we have got historical amount of people quitting jobs. We talk about it on a regular basis here. And uh, we have a very popular free quiz I'll tell you about in just a moment. But I wanted to just break this down because I think a lot of people have a lot of angst over this. I think with the, you know, I think we're in what I would call a baby recession. I don't think that we're in some big bad recession. I think we're in a baby recession. And I don't know how long it's going to last. But here's what I know about the human spirit. When we hear bad news and signs of a storm coming, what do we do? We look for shelter. We begin to think through all of the worst possibilities. And so I want to help you be able to emotionally and mentally process the answer, excuse me, the question rather, that many people have asked this year. People have asked this question throughout the history of work, and it is, should I quit my job? Should I quit my job? So how do you know if you're in the wrong job and thus you should quit? So let's look at Three ways, I'm going to call these three status, right? This is your status. This is your state. And this is how you'll know it's time to start looking and making plans to leave. First one is you're in the wrong role in the wrong place. So we're going to talk about job overall. So this is the the occupation, the job I'm in. But then we're going to actually look at the fit. And so when we say wrong role, we're saying you're in the wrong seat. And when we say wrong place, we're talking about the wrong bus. So the first thing you look at is you go, okay, am I in the right role? And if you're in the wrong role, uh uh-oh, that's bad. And then if you're in the wrong place, ooh, that's worse. So this is a total non-fit. So let me explain. We know that you're in the wrong role where you're not using what you do best to do work you love to produce results that matter to you, or it's not a ladder type role. So there are many times where we are not in our sweet spot. I define that sweet spot as as the dream job, spending most of our day using what we do best, doing work we love, producing results that matter to us. That is the simple definition of a dream job. So there are times where we're not, we don't have that intersection of talent, passion, and mission. But it is strategic because we are on the right ladder, so we are doing what we have to do so we can do what we want to do, okay? But this is a situation, wrong role, where we go, "It's it's not a good fit for me for a multitude of reasons. And then you go, well, could I get in another in another seat on the bus? You go, I don't want to be on this bus. It's a bad bus, bad culture. It's not a good culture. It's not healthy. My values don't align with this place. Well, that means you were in the wrong role in the wrong place. So you don't feel fulfilled uh, because you're not doing uh, the right work, whether, again, it's the sweet spot or the right work to get you into the sweet spot. So it's not the right work, and then it's not the right fit, the right place. So that's wrong role, wrong place. That is, hey, there is no more deliberation, folks. When you come to that conclusion, your time is quickly coming to an end. And so we begin looking for something. Now, here's the second way to know that you're in the wrong job. You're in the wrong role, so we've already walked through that. So it's just not the right fit for you. It's not the right seat on the bus. But you are in the right place. In other words, you go, I like the company. This is a healthy culture. They value you. They value me. They uh, Their values, my values are in alignment. It's a really good company. So in other words, I like the bus. I'm just in the wrong seat. 
So now uh, we've got some partial good news. Partial good news is we like the place. And so our deliberation comes down to one thing. Is there a seat on the bus that is absolutely my sweet spot? Or is there a seat on the bus that gets me on the right rung of the ladder that I want to climb? So it's the next thing. It's the space I need to get into to pay my dues and win in that now in order to get that ultimate next. So now you're looking around because you love the place. We go, is there a seat that is the right fit for me? So that's the deliberation. Now, I want to encourage you on this. There are times where you're going to find that seat, but there are times where it's going to feel a little confusing, largely because you've got mixed emotions. I know I'm not in the right seat, so I'm not fulfilled there, and there's some angst and longing there, but I really like these people. Gosh, they treat me well, and I like being around them, and I feel safe and stable. So that's a confusing mix. But there's other good people, other good places. And at the end of the day, staying in a situation like this where it's the right place with the wrong role, I, I got news for you. It's still going to suck the soul out of your body. It just is. Now, the third way to know, and this is a flip of the second. So the third is I'm in the right role. Hey, right seat. I, I am uh, fulfilled when I'm engaged in the work. Uh, I am producing excellence. I mean, I'm in the right seat. It's good. But it's a crappy environment. It's a crappy place. Right seat, crappy bus, right? I mean, that's just, that's what it is. And you and see, this is also confusing because you're like, when I'm engaged in the work, when I don't have crappiness coming at me, and by the way, this is what happens in this environment where you're in the right role, wrong place. You're trying to focus. You're trying to do a good job. And when they leave you alone, and it's intermittent, you're able to really be in the zone. But that is a limited opportunity for you because most of the time monkey crap's coming at you, right? It's just, it's like a crazy zoo and the monkeys are throwing the poo, right? That's what's going on. And, and, and you can't take that. Because you don't, you're on, you aren't able to focus on doing the work that you love. You aren't able to focus on being who you were created to be and, and really excelling in that seat because of all the distractions of the toxicity. So same thing here. The good news, you've identified and you have experienced fulfillment in the actual work. But this isn't the right place. And, this, and, and so that's the good news. Okay, I know what I'm looking for, so I got to go look for it. This is also a little confusing because you go, oh, gosh, I love the work, but these people are driving me nuts. And don't try to stick this out. You will not be able to stick it out because I don't care if it's the dream job or not. If you are trying to perform the dream job in a nightmare environment, the nightmare always wins. It just will suck the soul right out of you. You cannot separate the emotional negativity that comes from working in a toxic or poor culture. You can put up with it for a while, but only long enough to move on. Now, why do I teach this? Because, folks, there are options. There are always options. And life is too short to work in a place that's sucky and makes you feel stuck. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. Have you ever had a moment that you discovered something new and, and once you realized how awesome it was, it changed your entire outlook? Not just the newness, but it changed your outlook. Uh, well, that could be true when you discover new jobs, new career paths. I like to tell people, if you're new to this program, when you say a phrase like the dream job to a lot of people, they get freaked out. It intimidates them because it feels like, well, there's only one of them and there's a whole lot of stress trying to pick that. And, and if I told you that there was more than one dream job for you, it'd probably chill you out. So be chilled out, but also get excited about seeing something new, a new culture, a new opportunity, a new ladder to grow. That's why I endorse my friends at ZipRecruiter. They take the yuck and the suck out of the job search and the anxiety 
and they are recruiting on your behalf. It's a free service to you. Companies pay ZipRecruiter for access to talent. That's you. So I'm telling everybody listening and watching, if you're thinking about it, kick the tires. You don't have to commit to anything, but they're going to send you opportunities. And it's still up to you to decide, and they and you go find your own as well. But this is a free resource that allows you to continue on with life and do your own search and be looking for your own things and use the proximity principle that says in order to do what you want to do, get around people that are doing it in places where it's happening. But also allow a world-class organization like ZipRecruiter to be pushing, uh, pushing you to companies. And when a company say they are interested, they put you in direct contact and you get an interview and now you're off and running. ZipRecruiter.com slash Ken. ZipRecruiter.com slash Ken. Uh, okay, a couple things I want to get to. Uh, I'm going to get to the, the, the world's biggest four-day work week trial in a second because I want to spend more time on that. So I want to lead with another story, and I think this is a this is going to be a trend. And I think that, uh, again, I have a, a, a broad audience, and I know I've got people that are in leadership roles, and you answer, to, obviously, to leaders. And some of you are not in a leadership role, and, and, and so you are reporting to leaders, and you got to be paying attention to how the sands may be shifting as we go into this, what I'm calling a baby recession, because changes are already happening. So here are two biggies. And the reason I'm focusing on these two big brands is because when big companies start doing it and media outlets start reporting on it, it has a massive trickle-down effect. So Google and Facebook both have gone public recently and essentially warning the slackers. And so there is belt tightening going on. Quick context. When major public companies that are beholden to their stockholders, when downturns are forecasted, not even there, but forecasted in the economy, they already begin to go, okay, we got to tighten up. Because if this affects us, our stock price drops, then we got to reduce our expenses. I mean, this is a big old chess game. So y'all need to understand this. It doesn't mean that the sky is falling. It just means that public companies are way more sensitive and way more anticipatory than, like, say, the other leaders you pay attention to, those boneheads in Congress. They don't. Politicians don't react to anything other than a poll number and a social media negative comment. But real leaders, real entrepreneurs, real business people, well, they're paying attention to trends, and they go, you know, we're going to be smart about this. And we may tighten up in anticipation of a downturn. That's all that's happening. So uh, you're going to see this. Anytime there's a recession or warning of a recession, you'll see job layoffs. Everybody relax and breathe. Uh, so it's Zuckerberg, who's the meta CEO. I hate that name with a deep abiding passion. So it's Facebook guy. Um, and then Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai, if I'm saying that right, he's the CEO of Google. Uh, they both have made comments. You know, Zuckerberg has said things like, hey, we're just turning up the heat a little bit. Because if we're paying you, you need to be uber productive. That's not unreasonable. And you know, I'll, I will absolutely go after leaders if I think that they're just being stupid. I don't think this is unreasonable. Uh, Zuckerberg went on to say, I think some of you might decide this place isn't for you. This is a this is an internal memo. He goes, and that self-selection is okay with me. So you got big shots like this is Facebook. They got cash all over the place. They're going, hey, look, you got to you gotta deliver. If you're slacking right now, we're going to notice because we're putting more attention on you. More on that in just a moment. Google CEO said, we have real concerns that our productivity as a whole is not where it needs to be for the headcount we have. So if here's the reason I report this. If Google and Facebook CEOs are saying, hey, we're putting the microscope on you, we're tightening up. If you're not delivering, we may lay your tail off, then this is going to trickle down to you. Now, here's the thing I want to just say very quickly, and I want to get on to this next story because this is unbelievable. Largest study ever on a four-day work week, and we have the data. This is fascinating. But listen to me, leaders. Don't be like, Zuckerberg and the Google guy and wait for a, a tightening of the economy to be focusing on productivity. This, this is this is this is not the way you do it. It's not good leadership. 
It's nanny ship. It's a reaction, right? Parents lead their kids. Nannies punish the kids, right? It's like, hey, I'm going to take your toys away if you don't stop hitting your brother. You know what I mean? They're just trying to get through until mom and dad get home. Well, that, that, that's poor leadership. No, we should always be making sure and always be communicating with the team and always have healthy measurements to say, hey, are you thriving? So don't wait until it gets bad. Okay, this is the story that I'm very intrigued by. Uh, this is really, really interesting. A CNN article here, for the past eight weeks, thousands of people in the United Kingdom have tested a four-day schedule. I talked about this a few months ago. And so now here we go. I'm very excited to report this. This is very interesting. Uh, four-day schedule, no cut to their pay. It's the world's biggest trial. And uh, some of the early results are workers are loving it. Surprise, surprise. This is a six-month pilot, and 3,300 workers across 70 companies were basically told, we want you to work 80% of your usual week, four-day work week. But you got to promise that you're going to have high productivity during the four days, right? So a little bit of an honor thing, and we're going to see how it plays out. Well, um, I'll, I'm not going to get into the, the company that's running. It's a nonprofit in in in, in uh, a collaboration with Cambridge, Oxford, and Boston College. So listen to this. They're measuring productivity levels, gender equality, the environment, and worker well-being. So that's what they're looking at. We're not going to break all that down. Um, when they first started it, um, it had a lot of hiccups, as you can imagine. How do you go from a normal rhythm of five days and you squeeze it into four? So here's a quote from uh, Samantha Losey, who was the managing director at a public relations agency. Uh, and she said it was chaotic the first week, first two weeks. She said it was a mess. We were all over the place. I thought I'd made a huge error. I didn't know what I was doing. But they found ways to make it work. Now the company has, and this is exciting. Listen to this. This PR agency now has banned all internal meetings that are longer than five minutes. Can we get some angelic music from the sky here? This is like my dream company. I hate meetings with a deep abiding passion. Uh, folks, this can work. So what they said was, is we're banning internal meetings longer than five minutes. We keep all client meetings to 30 minutes or less. And then they've created this little traffic light system to prevent unnecessary dis disturbances. Colleagues have a light on their desk. If it's set to green, you can stop by and bother them. Um, if it's red, they're heads down. She said uh, there is absolutely a possibility they could go back to a five-day schedule if productivity drops. So far, so good. Listen to this. Gary Conroy, founder and CEO of Five Squirrels, skincare manufacturer in England's South Coast said, they have instituted deep work time. What does that look like? This is amazing, leaders. Listen to this. For two hours every morning and two hours every afternoon, the staff ignores all emails and phone calls. No emails and calls for four hours. He said it turns this place into like a library. People's heads are down. It's quiet and people are getting their done so i am not saying that i endorse this i'm saying it's very interesting and i'm all for leaving me alone for four hours stop sending me emails Oh, yeah, I like that bump, Joe. Let that one play for a second. By the way, that's how you feel right there. You feel that? That's how you feel on Monday morning when you're doing what you were created to do. You know what I mean? You're kind of like, all right, I'm about ready to walk in the office and just crush it, baby. Watch out for me. All right. You feel that? This is real, folks. It's real. By the way, uh, this is my, uh, I don't know, I feel like I do this, what, three times a year? I'm a big believer in a playlist. Uh, I think you got to have your, your your start of the week playlist, 
whether you're crushing that in the shower or in the car on the way in. I think you got to have a playlist when you've had a long day, tough day. I think you got to have a playlist on that drive home before you walk and drag all that crap into the house with you. You got to have a playlist to get it out. You got to have a play- playlist when something goes great. Like the end of the day, it's a great day. I mean, man, yeah, you got to have that free fall in track, you know, that that uh, Jerry Maguire moment in the car. He signed Kush, baby, and he's excited about it. You got to have that too. Uh, you got to have the playlist. I'm a big, big fan of the playlist. So, uh, hey, uh, every day on the show, and we're in the middle of our coaching session right now, you know I coach people, but I have very limited time to coach you. And so one of my dreams is to have an army of men and women that are coaches, world-class certified coaches that can coach you in any aspect of your professional journey. They can coach you personally so that you can win professionally. And so we have a pilot program called Ramsey Career Coaching. um, And uh, space is limited because we're going to do a smaller group of people and just kind of see how it plays out. So we're going to be shutting that down soon, but we still do have some uh, opportunity to get in. KenColeman.com slash coaching. In fact, had a couple people reach out to me on Instagram today and uh, said, hey, how can I sign up? KenColeman.com slash coaching. KenColeman.com slash coaching. Andrew's up in Greenville, South Carolina. Andrew, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, Ken, how are you doing? I'm living the dream. What's going on with you? Um, so I am just uh, calling today for some advice, um, maybe some encouragement. Um, I am 23, um, just graduated uh, from Clemson University uh, a year ago, actually, right. uh, a year ago nice. uh, this August. Um, okay. And so um, currently just in a job that um, I just I don't love. Um, I, I struggled when I got out of school mm. to find a job um, and and when actually went to work at, um, at Costco, uh, for a little bit. And okay. then, um, I'm in the job that I'm in now as a home evaluator with an exterminating company. Okay. Um, my degree is in, uh, business management, okay. um, from Clemson. And, um, what made yeah, you pursue, just, what made you pursue business management? Um, so my dad owns his own uh, business. He's been a photographer for, uh, 25 years. Um, and so, um, wanting to, um, get just all aspects of, of business, um, get knowledge in all of those aspects. For um, what that, reason? That's really what made me pursue that. For what reason? Um, to eventually start my own business. There we go. So I'm trying to dig. Um, so do you still yeah. have that same desire to one day work for yourself? Oh yeah. 100%. Oh, a boy. All right. So my guess is you got a couple of ideas or a couple hundred ideas. What is it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, I worked on, um, I worked on some things while I was in college, um, but just never actually launched them. Okay. Um, Let's have some fun. All right. I want you to turn your brain off and I want you to let your heart answer the question. Does that make sense? I don't want you to think, I want you to just blurt it out. Okay. What business would you start today? And it doesn't have to, I don't need some fancy elevator pitch. All right. Okay. I just want you to describe the business that you would start today, today, right now. If you knew you couldn't fail, what would you do? Um, I would start an outdoor apparel company. An outdoor apparel company. Fantastic. And what excites you about having your own outdoor apparel company? Real answer here. Um just i've always been fascinated by clothing and um especially just outdoor apparel um because it's it's there's a specific specific uh market that that is for um and i love the outdoors and so great if i can make my own um and then also have a cause um that it's going to um it's that fantastic is, this is fantastic. That's just kind of what drives me. Hey, uh, just a quick question, and and I and I'm not trying to go somewhere. I just just a real quick question. Have you ever? Did you ever in your time at Clemson have a professor walk you through those questions I just walked you through? Um, not specifically like that. Um, I know, and I get. But, it. I'll leave it at that. I'll yeah. leave it at that. There you go, folks. Yeah. Uh, this is huge, Andrew. So, no, Andrew, my, what? 
What you got? I'm about to take you my somewhere. My next thing is, is, is so I, I'm supposed to, I'm getting married in November. Um, Congratulations. But the, the biggest thing right now is that my job that I'm currently in, I'm only making about thirty to 35000 um, yeah, And I, I, I got you. My, my fiance is in dental school, and so I really need to be making more money. How much? Than I'm making now. How much do you need to make? Um, we sat down and did a budget, and I need to be making fifty-five. All right, great. A minimum. Great. So we got fifty-five thousand dollars as our target, right? Yeah, I got you. You listen to me now. You need to be working for an outdoor company. That is our number one choice. I'm not saying it's the only choice. But I'm saying, Mm -hmm. you called me and you're going, Ken, I've struggled to get a job. I don't like what I do. I've been out of college for a year. My fiance is in dental school. i got to make more money. And I'm going to solve it all with one thing. You haven't landed anywhere that you really want to be because you can't get excited about anything. But I'm now saying, based on the destination of owning your own outdoor company or outdoor apparel company or whatever, 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 I'm going to go try to work for somebody like that. So, for instance, instead of working at Costco, maybe I'm working at REI. You understand mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Instead of working at Costco, maybe I'm working for, uh, Joe, what's that that store you probably go to all the time? It's like Walmart for fishermen and hunters. Oh, Bass Pro Shops. You know, who's competing with Bass Pro Shops? I don't know these things. Maybe I'm going to go work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not an outdoorsman, as we can all tell. Uh, but, but you know, it, it, I, I'm going to work at Dick's, and I'm going to work in that. My point is, you've got to get in the area of the place that you would eventually like to be. I call it the proximity principle. In order to do what you want to do, Andrew, own your own outdoor apparel company one day, you got to get around people that are doing that now and get yeah. in places where that kind of work is happening. Why? Two reasons. Number one, you're going to be in a place to be paid to learn how to run those businesses. You got your head on a swivel, man. Number two, you're going to make tremendous connections that are already in that industry. So you are paving your way while making more money. All right. Now, I cannot guarantee you today that you're going to make 55000 by pivoting from where you are now into one of those companies, but it's possible Mm -hmm. But, you know, retail right now is a little bit down, but maybe those types of retail stores are up. But here's what I know. You're 23. You got no kids. You got a fiance. You haven't put a ring on it yet, but she's going to dental school. So you don't have a life right now. You don't need a life. It's work and her. So if you've got to get in at REI or Bass Pro Shops or fill in the blank, Columbia or whoever makes Joe help me out. What are some popular clothes that are out uh, outdoor clothes? Who knows? Banana Republic. But it, no, Joe, it's not banana. <laughs> oh, jeez. Can we delete that from the show? Listen to me. Here's the deal. You have to work two jobs, maybe. So if I can go get a job okay. working for Patagonia, there it is. It finally came to me. Uh, and I make forty five making uh, working for Patagonia. But I can make 10 doing something else. Now I'm at 55. Our budget's okay, and I'm in proximity. Do you understand what I'm saying, young man? Yeah, I do. You got it, don't you? I do, yeah. I just right. got to make it happen. That's my, that's my man. Stop thinking, stop talking, start doing. This is The Ken Coleman Show. Press on. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.